we thank you for taking the time to be with us at C3. We hope you enjoy today's message. All right, so Pastor Ryan was correct. We are in Romans today, again. But you know what? We're actually almost done. Oh, kids, get out of here. Trying to sneak out. Just go, Jan, you know. Your kids are awesome. They're in great hands today. Pastor Rini's on the trip as well, um, but we have a phenomenal kids team, uh, even though we do need more volunteers in the nursery. You know, the ones we have are are killing it right now. They're awesome. So we're in Romans. We are kind of getting towards the end, though. There's only a few more chapters and uh, a few more weeks, so um, hopefully you guys have enjoyed it, uh, but you might be ready for something else. That's cool. There's still a lot more good stuff to come, though, I promise. So... um, We're here in Romans chapter 12 today, so you can open your Bibles there if you want. Um, And it it feels to me like life as a Christian can get kind of overwhelming sometimes. There's there's lots to learn, there's lots to remember, and lots that it feels like we may never understand. And sometimes it seems like the deeper you go, you know, there's maybe more to uncover. And I think that's kind of the beauty and the struggle with the faith walk. That there's always more kind of to learn and to understand, but at the same time, the simplest understanding is enough sometimes. And so it's this kind of catch-22 here. But what it really boils down to, if you, if, you know, if, you, if you've dug into um, theology at any level, it can kind of feel like a lot of stuff. But what it really boils down to at its very simplest and most basic form, Christianity following Jesus is striving to love God and love people. There's a lot more to it, but that's kind of like the day in and day out. What are we trying to do here? How is this affecting our lives? What are we doing with it? Love God and love people. Now, sure, that little cliche has a nice ring to it. It makes a good mission statement or a life mantra, but sometimes it leaves us wondering how. You know, you, you, get, a, you get a nice thought and you say, okay, well, that's great, but how, how do I go about doing that? How do we love God? How do we love people uh, specifically? Sometimes I find myself thinking, okay, this is all cool. I get it. Um, these big concepts about how we order our world and stuff are fine, but right now I just need something basic, something direct, some attainable goals uh, for how to get through today and know that I'm making a difference. Am I alone in that? Do you guys ever feel like that? If you just let me give me something for today, <laughs> like, give me something that I can just kind of uh, uh, strive to do right now. Something very practical, very tangible. Well, here's Paul giving us just that. Now, you might think of Paul as anything but practical, anything but simple, um, but I think that's the beauty of, of, of his letters is that he goes so deep for so long, and then he comes back out, and he says, okay, now here's kind of how this plays out. Here's the bottom line. Here's the basic stuff, right? So at the end of the day, it'd be really nice if you could sort of go through a checklist of ways you treated people and know if you were on the right track of loving or not. So, so he's laid out, Paul, uh, 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 chapter after chapter of rich theology, the why behind all this. So if you're a why person, if you need to know the ins and outs, how does all this work? How is it that we can love God and love other people and all this stuff and, and, and all the justification, all the stuff that brings us to this point, you can go back, you can listen to the last like several months of sermons, or you can just go and try and read Romans for yourself, which is great. I encourage you to do that. Um, go ahead go crazy. But now what Paul is doing is, is what he does at the end of so many of his letters. He cuts through all the lofty head knowledge. He cuts through all of the, the, the deep, like really theological stuff, and he gets right to the heart of what he wants us to do. Does that sound good? Does that sound helpful? Are you awake this morning? I know it's kind of fallish out there. Last week was 80 degrees. Today it's like cloudy and rainy, and my backyard's getting covered in leaves. But this is good stuff. So we're camping out here. We kind of, you might be feeling like, okay, we did this last week a little bit, Romans 12, verse 9, and some of this love stuff. We talked about this, but there's, there's so much here that we just felt like as a, as a teaching team, we couldn't just kind of go through it in one week or, or even two weeks. So we're kind of actually taking three weeks, um, <laughs> at least three weeks, because I'm on the next two. So I'm going to tell you, we're going to be in Romans 12 for for this week and next week, and then Pastor Rick can do what he wants when he comes back. But um, <clears throat> we're going to really kind of just take this apart a little bit because there's so much here, and it's, and it's so powerful, but it's so simple, and it's so easy to take for granted. It's one of those sections of Scripture that's, like, really easy to kind of read through and be like, 
yeah, okay, those are all good things. I'll, I'll try to do that. Great. But we really just need to sit on it for a minute and really just kind of take it apart. And so that's, that's kind of why we're, we're camping out here for a few weeks. Now, this section is entitled, um, in my Bible and in, in, in other translations, Marks of the True Christian. So that's kind of stole that title for the message today. Um, now, it's not Paul's heading. Obviously, the Bible wasn't written with, with chapters and verses and headings and all those kind of things. But somebody went back and said, you know what? These are kind of the marks of what makes person a, a, a true Christian. Now, there are more to that. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's very representative of, of somebody who does these things. You could look at them and say, that person kind of gets it. There's the, you can see the fruit of the Spirit, of a life lived following Jesus um, uh, kind of coming out of them. So it's a beautiful, wonderfully succinct and practical teaching on how to love other people. Are you ready? Here's what he starts with in Romans 12:9. He says, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Simple enough. Doesn't sound too hard, right? Hate what's evil. Cling to what is good. Let love uh, be genuine. And, and the love be genuine, that was kind of last week's message. That was a really good one on, on uh, the hypocrisy of love and not letting that uh, it has to do with wearing a mask and being your true self. And, and, and so that's a really great message. Go back and listen to that one if you haven't. Um, but this week we're going to focus on hating what is evil and holding fast to what is good. Evil is one of those words that may mean something a little bit different depending on who uh, is using it. Mankind has struggled to define this idea of evil for millennia. It's um, kind of been like attributed to uh, everything from, like, natural disasters used to be called evil. Um, and then now as we've kind of matured in our understanding of how hurricanes work and earthquakes work and tectonic shifts and these different things, we've, we see these acts of God and we don't necessarily attribute them to God anymore, right? We, we, we kind of started to understand our world. And so um, so rather than try to justify how God could, could do an earthquake or something like that, we, we realize that, you know, that's kind of the way the creation is and that's just part of the world that we live in, this fallen world, this creating crying out for redemption, crying out to be made new. And so then it, then it goes, and, y- and you might be thinking about really, really bad things. I mean, there are, there are plenty of things that we can look at and say, that's evil. But even today, there's hardly a universal um, sort of definition uh, of the word evil. And when I say evil, you may be thinking about really bad things like terrorism or murder, stealing uh, genocide. Now I'm not talking about like taking a pack of gum from the, you know, I'm talking about things like Equifax, you know, stuff like that. Like that's borderline. You could call that evil. 125 million or, or more, 150 million people's credit stuff and personal information stolen, taken right out from under you. Like that's, that's pretty messed up. You might want to call that evil. But we're rarely faced with any situation as immense and, 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 and intense uh, uh, to call it evil, I mean, like you might think about you might think about the Holocaust. That's one one moment in history we could almost u- universally look back and say that was evil, right? But even in our day to day thing, we're rarely faced with anything as as immense as the systematic massacre of millions. Even more difficult in trying to define this idea of what is evil is recognizing the fact that one what one considers evil, uh, another may just call a means to an end. And that might be a hard pill to swallow, but um, let, me, let, me, let me explain what I mean. It's, it's very difficult as human beings to go around saying that's evil, that's evil, that's evil, that's definitely evil, and have everyone uniformly agree. It will always carry uh, the perspective of the one using the word. Does that make sense? So I could sit up here and say cats are evil, and I would mean it wholeheartedly. But if you look behind you, Carrie is about to jump out of that sound booth and come up here and tackle me, right? They're creepy, they're weird, they're like, they hide under things, you never see them anyway, they kind of smell bad, like, they're just, they're just freaky. Can't do it. But that's definitely not, you know, universally established, right? Um, have you guys noticed in, in movies, television, kind of the way we tell our stories today, um, <coughs> Bad guys aren't just bad guys anymore. Have you noticed that? Like, there was a time growing up, and I grew up kind of in the 90s, and, um, and it seemed like the bad guys were the bad guys. And they were just bad guys because they were bad guys, right? It was just that. You got the good guy, and you got the bad guy, and it's good versus evil, and it's black and white, and it's easy. 
Well, now, I don't know what happened. If we got bored as a society and that stopped being entertaining or if people as writers got smart or whatever, but now you have this very complex um, idea of a bad guy in a movie, right? And, and, and there are so many movies where the bad guy is not just bad from start to finish. He has a story. He has kind of like a reason for doing what he's doing. And it complicates the whole thing. And now, <clears throat> there's two ways to kind of go about this. Now, the, the, the one way is that there is evil, right? And we don't want to justify what is evil. But we also have to be very careful of what we throw the evil definition at. Does that make sense? And so what happens is, when it comes to another person, if you immediately write them off as evil, there's no hope but enmity there for, for the rest of your interaction with that person, right? But when, when they can tell a story and they can make the bad guy, the evildoer, the bad guy, they can be, uh, you can have sympathy for that person, empathy for that person. You know, there are, there are shows out there that you're watching and you're like, man, I hated this guy. Now I'm like, you know what, I kind of like him. And you start rooting for the bad guy, right? Have you ever experienced that? You're like, am I an awful person? I'm rooting for the bad guy, you know? But that's, that's, that's really, honestly, I think that's a, that's a very valuable piece in storytelling. Because very little is exactly what it seems like. It can be easy to run around and say cats are evil, but you know what? I've never really owned a cat. So at the same time, I probably don't actually understand cats. And you guys are all probably here like, just give them a chance. They're really cuddly. You know, when everybody goes home and finally leaves you alone, they come out and you can snuggle and they purr and it's the best thing ever. It still freaks me out. But the point is, it's, you, you, it's, it's difficult to just go, this is evil, this is evil, this is evil. So what do we do? How do we hate what is evil if we have such a hard time defining what is evil? Well, thank goodness we serve a God that's unchanging, right? That there is a definition of what is evil. That there is uh, uh, something that we can put our finger on and say, this is what we are to hate. This is what we are supposed to run from. See, there's a lot of mixed kind of things in the world. There's a lot of evil that might be called good and good that might be called evil. And Isaiah 520 speaks very strongly against that. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. It's a fascinating little chapter. And it reads, uh, even though it's an ancient context, reads very modern uh, if you read chapter 5 of Isaiah. But contrary to popular opinion, truth is not subjective. There is truth out there to be had. There are many places in the Bible we can go to see what it is God considers evil. And we have to be very careful when we do that because there are some things um, that, that may, may seem evil. But as we read through Scripture, as we begin to understand God's story and interaction with humanity, and we see it through the eyes of Jesus, that, that what may have been considered evil once was actually a misunderstanding, misrepresentation until we look at Jesus. But let me go back to the beginning. I think the creation story uh, in particular, is very helpful in this context. So if you go back to Genesis, and we're not going to read, you know, much here, but if you want, you can flip there. <clears throat> and the creation story goes, you know, something like this. In the beginning, right, God created the heavens and the earth, and, and he goes on, and day by day, he creates everything that's in it. And he creates birds, and he creates fish, and he creates uh, eagles and seagulls, uh, which my son has confused at the moment, which is very fun. Um, and he, he creates... Um, trees and plants and all the stuff, right? And it's this really great, uh, great, 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 great passage of Scripture. And <clears throat> he gets to man, and he makes man, and he's like, you know, it's, it's good. Man's pretty cool. He's in our image. We breathe our life into him, but it's not good that he is uh, alone. So he creates woman out of man, and now he's got Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve are in this really, it's this really special time where, where there's no sin in the world yet. They're just walking around in the garden, and it says the, uh, the, the, the Lord God would walk with them in the cool of the day in the garden. What a cool image that is. And they're just kind of with God all the time, right? <clears throat> and God gives them lots and lots of responsibility. He says, you've got to name all these animals, and you're going to do all this, and you're going to take care of the garden. And he kind of he kind of gives man this ability to, to sort of create alongside in some ways, and it's really cool. And he says, okay, you guys can do anything you want. You can take part of anything you want. But there's this tree in the middle of the garden, this tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, you, you can eat of all the trees, you can do all stuff, but don't eat the fruit of that tree. He doesn't really give much why or, 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 or reason behind it, but he says, don't do it. 
And for a while, Adam and Eve seemed pretty contented to leave it alone. Until one day, a serpent comes, and it says to them, hey, you know, what's going on? Why, why, uh, why haven't you eaten of this tree? Don't you think God's hiding something for you? And he tempts Eve, right? And as the story goes, Eve kind of gives in. She's like, you know what, that's a good point. Maybe I should try it. And so she eats some of it, and she gives some to Adam, and they eat this fruit. And it says in, in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, that after they ate the fruit, it says, then the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Isn't that interesting? They eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the first thing that they notice about each other is their nakedness, and on top of that, their difference. There's a man and a woman, very different. <laughs> okay, We don't need a health class in here, but we know they're different. And so they cover which part of themselves? They cover their arms, they cover their hands, they cover the parts that are different about each other. See, they recognize their nakedness for the very first time, and they're ashamed of it. And it gets worse. The next day, they're hiding from God as he's walking through the garden in the cool of the day. And he's looking for them, and he calls out, and God asks them why they're hiding. And Adam replies, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Again, naked, ashamed, hiding from the Lord now. So there's this element of shame. There's this element of embarrassment, right? Nakedness is vulnerability. There's a reason we wear clothes, and it has a lot more to do with uh, uh, things other than just the temperature outside, okay? Clothing is a security. It's a, it's a covering. Nakedness is our being without any sort of coverage. It's our true physical self without disguise. What you see is what you get. And there's a lot of shame involved with nakedness for good reason. There's a lot of shame involved with our, our bodies, though, but, but, but not all of it is well-founded. See, for some reason, the first thing Adam and Eve notice is that they are different, and they're not okay with it. That's, that's the interesting thing. They hide it. They're ashamed of what their differences are. Now, don't panic. Stay with me, guys, because your mind's probably going, we're going to be okay. So what's evil has a lot to do with what is different, or better yet, how we behave toward what is different. So hold on to that for a moment. Let's go to cha Proverbs chapter 6. So if you open the middle of your Bible, you're probably going to find Psalms, and then go to the right a few pages, and you're going to find Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 6, 4, 5, and 6. You there? This is another great, great little section. Proverbs is a lot of like just a verse or two verses at a time. This is kind of a chapter that kind of runs on itself. But it culminates here in, in verse 16. And it says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. <laughs> I love that. That that to me, the first time you read it, especially in English, is like, there are six things the Lord hates. Oh, wait, we forgot one. There are seven that are an abomination to him, you know. That's not exactly what it's saying. What it's saying, that's a literary element to say, pay attention to the seventh thing in this list of six. Does that make sense? So there are seven things, and the seventh one is, is extra important. So here they are, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. If the Lord hates it and considers it an abomination, it's a good bet you could call that thing evil. That's probably a fair place to start. Can we agree with that? Haughty eyes looking down on other people as if you're better than they are. A lying tongue hiding the truth or creating a false truth uh, uh, to the other people. Shedding innocent blood, that's pretty self-explanatory on many levels. Devising wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil, as opposed to feet that would run from evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. There it is again. 
safe to say that untruthfulness at all levels is a pretty big issue. And one who sows discord among brothers, strife, division, hatefulness, not good. By the way, that's the one, that's the seventh one. So that might be the abomination. It's the one who sows discord among brothers, sisters, family members. And if you experience that in your family or among your friends, that's not a pleasant thing when somebody comes in, uh, especially among churches as well. So these are all fairly specific things, but they all have something very much in common. Each one of these, if you notice, has something to do with how we treat other people, doesn't it? Every one of these involves a relationship with another person. You know, you can lie to yourself, but, you know, you're really not doing a lot of bad things until you're lying to another person, until you are shedding the innocent blood of another person. You can't sow discord among yourself. That happens among groups of people, doesn't it? These all have to do with how we treat other people. See, sin wants to be this sneaky, complex thing. It wants to run around and, and make you think it's this and make you focus on that. And too often we play its game. Our defense mechanisms want to let us sit here and think, I hate evil. I have nothing but contempt for terrorists, mass murderers, drug dealers, adulterers, etc. I can get this big list of grandiose evil things and think, I don't do any of those. But it's so often so much simpler and less grandiose if we get so hung up on the big lofty things that are out there in the world, we often miss the speck or the plank that's in our own eye. So let's bring it home. See, it really only ever comes down, sin, really only ever comes down to how we treat other people. That's so often the, the, the key issue in any sin we commit. How you treat another created human being. That's a pretty large, all-encompassing thing. You can fit a lot into that, right? The recurring issue in Israel was always how they treated their neighbors. That's what the Old Testament is, the story of this people, Israel, and their journey with God. It runs right through the Old Testament, smack into the new, when Jesus' primary conflict is with who? Who's Jesus' primary conflict with? the most religious and God-fearing people in the whole country of Israel. That's who he's constantly butting heads with. Can you imagine that? The Pharisees are supposed to know what's going on. They're supposed to be the keepers of this law. They're supposed to understand how this all works. And they're the ones constantly coming at Jesus. If 39 Old Testament books aren't enough for us to, under, for us to understand how important this is. Jesus connected the dots and put it all together for us. Go to Matthew chapter 22. We'll be in verse 36. First book of the New Testament. So one of the Pharisees, they come to Jesus and they say, you know, hey, let's, let's ask him a question. Let's try and trap him. We've got all these laws, all these commandments. Let's ask him Jesus, which, if you're so smart, is the greatest of all the commandments? Everything in the Old Testament law, all this stuff that we're supposed to keep, which every single bit of it was, was pretty much as important as the next thing. If you broke one little piece, you broke the whole thing. It was this big deal. So they asked Jesus, what's the most important one? Trying to trap him. Yeah, good luck. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Okay, I think we can get on board with that. It's pretty easy. It's, it, can be, it can be easy to love God sometimes. It can be very difficult to love God, but it can be very easy to love God because you don't always deal with that shame of another person. That's another day for another, another message. So the greatest and first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. But where we all get hung up is the second one, verse 39. The second is like it. So he gives them a bonus answer. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Do you hear the weight of that statement? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Now, eventually, the Pharisees are like, let's catch him again. Who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells this great story about a, a guy who gets robbed on the side of the road, and all the people who should have helped him didn't stop to help him, and the one person who had every reason in the book not to stop and help him did stop and help him. He said, who is the neighbor to this man? He said, the Samaritan. So basically, the point is, who is my neighbor? Everybody. <laughs> you don't get to draw distinctions and lines. It's not your immediate next-door neighbor. It's not the person only that you're sitting in the row with. It's not just the people in our own country. It's everyone is your neighbor. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Think about the, the weightiness of that for a moment, the loftiness of that. Do you see where the love God, love people comes from? That's not an easy thing to do, but it's so important. So you cannot truly, fully, perfectly love your neighbor as yourself without loving God first. That's why it's the first commandment. The only way that we're able to do that, the only way we can have any capacity to love neighbors that we wouldn't generally prefer to get along with is because of the love given to us by Christ. Do you understand that? That's why we've got 11 chapters of Romans before we get to this. That's what we've been unpacking and kind of building to. You cannot do this without loving God first. But Jesus links them so closely together that you cannot love God with all your heart, soul, and mind unless you love your neighbor as yourself. Don't miss that. They go right together. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot separate these two ideas. So you could say it this way. You cannot love your neighbor without loving God. And you cannot love God unless you love your neighbor. The Apostle John would say it this way in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. And those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. You can't separate. Now listen to me. I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to you guys. This is, this is pivotal to our faith. This is, this is what we do every day. This is what we strive for, right? We love God by loving our neighbors. Now, I promised I would make this insanely practical because I could sit up here and say, now go out and love your neighbors. See you next week. And you'll be like, I feel really bad about myself, and I don't even know how to fix it. Okay, that's not the point of today. The point is to, to, to put some weight on that statement, to walk away today knowing this is exactly what I'm supposed to do, and these are some ways that I can do it. Okay, can you get on board with that? Are we okay? Take a deep breath, guys. It's okay. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Go back and listen to it. It's in Romans. All right, so let's get back to Paul. Abhor what is evil. Hate what is evil. Wow, what is evil has a lot to do with the differences in the ways we treat our neighbors. And we're going to talk more about that next week. The second part is cling to what is good. Okay, so, so we have two parts to this, hate what's evil, cling to what is good. So what is good? We could talk for another hour about a hundred different ways to define what's good, right? But again, let's see what the Lord has to say. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, I love Micah, and I love the, the sixth chapter. It's, it's phenomenal. It's, it's like this high point in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Israel story of, Okay, you know, we've been trying to please God, we've been trying to do things right, but they've missed it so badly at this point that they think we could just sacrifice all these things and it would help, and we could do this and it would help, and we could do this and we could help. And, and, and God's like so tired of it. He's like, would you just pay attention? He's, and he goes on, he's like, if you sacrificed thousands of cattle, would it help? And he's like, no. He's like, well, if you sacrificed this, if you did this, if you did this, and you proved it this way and this way and this way, would it help? And the point is no. He says, he has told you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Not all these big sacrifices, not all these big shows of, of, of how spiritual you are. That's not what it's about. He says, this is what's required of you, to do justice and to love kindness or mercy and to walk humbly with your God. 
Doesn't that sound a lot easier than trying to sacrifice a bull or a sheep or a little bird and keep all these festivals? Doesn't that take the weight off a little bit? Like, he, it's not even been about all of that stuff that they've been doing. It's not about striving and proving and, and showing. It's about doing justice and loving kindness and walking humbly with your God. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then loving your neighbor as yourself. So we do justice to other people. We love kindness or show mercy to other people. And you don't think of yourself too proudly before God. That's it. That's like the big thing. He's like, don't, I don't need all these sacrifices. I just need you to do this. Show some mercy to somebody. Work out some justice in the world you live in. And don't think of yourself more proudly, more, more highly than you ought to. See, justice is about helping those in need of help. It goes beyond feeling bad when unfair things happen to people, but doing what you can to make a difference. It's about helping the unfortunate, not blaming them. Actively participating in what's going on, not just watching from a distance. Kindness, and specifically mercy, is helping people who we think don't deserve it. That's a hard one, because then you got to, first you have to get over, like, you have to think, okay, who do I think doesn't deserve mercy? That's a hard question, right? That's a hard question to ask, and that, that'll be next week, so come back. Um, we got to get over who we don't think, and then we have to extend mercy to it. The bottom line with mercy is that no one deserves it, but God gives it anyway. Amen? See, don't forget. We're not doing this in and of ourselves. We're not doing this because, you know, oh, I'm, I'm well-educated and I understand this and I'm going to be a good person. That's not where this comes from. This comes from uh, a, a relationship with God the Father who created you, said you have value, and, 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 and put you in a place and said, okay, now with the way that I have loved you, go and love your neighbors. Go and love those around you. That same forgiveness, that same mercy, that same grace that's been extended to us we are now called and expected to extend that to others. And this is about how we do that. So if we're to abhor evil, the Greek word speaks of a gag reflex, a complete aversion. So that word hate, abhor. It's like it's, it's, it's so awful, so foul to you that you want to turn away. I watched one clip for about 10 seconds of the shooting in Las Vegas last week. And I couldn't, I couldn't continue. It made me sick. That's that feeling. Now there's a lot of sadness, disappointment, anxiety filled in those emotions there. But that's, that's, that's what he's talking about. That's how you have to feel about what is evil. And that certainly falls into this category. To abhor evil, to hate it, is to run as far from it as possible. And when you run from something, you better be running to something. And that something should be, as Paul says, what is good. If you're abhorring evil, you're running from evil, you're running to, to cling to what is good. Love justice, watch, love mercy, walk humbly with God. So we have to stop looking down on other people. We have to stop lying or hiding the truth for any reason. Nothing can be accomplished when you're dealing with a false understanding. We have to stop shedding innocent blood. And this goes far beyond just the issue of abortion. Important as it is and a great place to start, this is a justice issue that hits everything from civil rights to the death penalty to all of that if we believe life is sacred. Sowing discord among brothers may be the worst of these. It seems to be emphasized as the one that God doesn't just hate, but considers an abomination. So instead of quickly running to evil, we need to train our feet to run toward what is good. And what is good is loving other people. Loving other people. So you want to know how to do it? Here's Paul's checklist. Romans 12. Verse 10. Can you get it on the screen, Carrie? 
Michael show up. Love one another with mutual affection. It's two way street. Ideally. Outdo one another in showing honor. <laughs> hey, husbands and wives. This guy, too. You ever tried that? Let me prefer you more than you prefer me. And it's like that old baseball game where you climb up the ladder. And it's, and it's like you just keep raising the stakes because the more I honor you, then the more you honor me. And guess what? Now we've elevated the way we treat each other, haven't we? That's pretty cool. Rejoice in hope. Oh, skip to verse. Do not lag in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Leave, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, we could preach a sermon on every one of these. That's quite a list of things to strive for. And that's part of why we're, we're, we're doing this in, in like three weeks. There's so much here about what to strive for every day. You could even bullet out these things or, or write each one on a post-it note and just kind of stick them and, and just uh, keep them before you all day long. You know, put them on like your home screen on your phone or on your mirror in your bathroom and just put a couple that you want to focus on. And I would even encourage you to do that, is to, to pick out a few. I'm sure as you read that, that, that passage there, at least one or two of those may have stuck out to you. You might have felt that little prick on your heart like, ooh, I'm not sure I do that. That would be a great one to go ahead and pull out and say, all right, this week or for a couple of weeks or even a month, I'm going to strive to do this. Remind yourself of these things and see if your attitudes don't change. See if your relationships don't change. See if you don't find yourself in the middle of God doing some pretty cool things in you and around you. This is how we cling to what is good. We don't flirt with evil. We don't play around with things that are dangerous, but run the opposite way to what is good. This, guys, is our call as followers of Christ. We all struggle with these things. That's why Paul puts such emphasis on this chapter of not thinking of yourself more than you ought to. We let pride seek in and we think, you know, I know somebody who has haughty eyes. You know, I know somebody who, that's, that's not the point. Let your guard down for a moment, at least for yourself. Let the word speak to you. Say, which of these things, how can I love my neighbors more? How can I, how can I uh, uh, let Christ form my heart even more? Because listen, we're in the context here in chapter 12 of, of not being conformed to the ways of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? So the ways of the world would value getting ahead, would value pride would value puffing yourself up and, and stepping on other people to get ahead. But the way of Christ values picking up the poor, finding ways to do justice, finding ways to extend mercy, outdoing each other in honor. Can you imagine your workplace if people outdid each other in honor? That would be a, be a game changer. Well, guess what? It could start with you. It could. It could. And that's, a, that's way more an encouragement as it is, how come you haven't been doing this already? Way more about, hey, try it tomorrow. You know, set a goal for yourself. Through Christ, you can do this. And see, <clears throat> Paul even calls us living sacrifices. See, when we, when we think too much of ourselves, as soon as it happens, we've already lied to ourselves and be, 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 become convinced that we don't struggle with evil. And this is, this is the problem with a living sacrifice sacrifice. See, to do some of this, you're going to have to give up some things. You know, you might know that, okay, if I, if I step on this guy just right, and then this guy sees it, then I'm going to get a promotion, and I'm going to get a raise. That's pretty sweet. But we're going to have to sacrifice some of those things. Sacrifice some of the things that we think 
that we want, that we think we need for the way of Christ. And, 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 and Paul calls us a living sacrifice. And that's the problem with a living sacrifice. It keeps crawling off the altar. That's a joke, guys. You can't, you can't sacrifice something that's like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> Can you imagine that? No, nothing wants to sit up there and get sacrificed and cut off. This stuff kind of hurts a little bit. There is sacrifice in following Christ. There is all that language in the Gospels about counting the cost, right? Don't build the tower unless you know how much it's going to cost. Jesus is saying, don't just start this getting all excited and all pumped up if you don't know what it's going to cost you to follow me. He's not trying to turn people away. He's just saying there is a cost to this. Now, the yoke is easy. The burden is light. There's grace and love and mercy, and it's beautiful, but it comes at a cost that we are now to love others the way we've been loved. Can you say amen to that? That's it, guys. See, we like to run around chasing after the will of God, but really what we're so often looking for is certainty. If we can just know what we're doing is God's perfect will, then we'll be right and justified however we do it. I just want to know the will of God. I got two choices. I want to know, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What's your will in this situation? But you know what God's perfect will is in every situation? It's not always about a choice. It's not always about a job. It's not always about a, 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 big, a big decision like that. God's perfect will in every situation, no matter what it is, is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So whatever your position in work, in family, in life, as a son, as a father, as a wife, as an employee, as a manager, as a CEO, whatever it is, do your best in that position to outdo others in honor. I don't know why I keep coming back to that, just really sticking out. To love your neighbor as you love yourself, to prefer other people, to seek justice and offer kindness and offer mercy. This, this list of things that Paul gives us is, is a great place to start. It's not an exhaustive list. There are plenty of other things we can do to show love, but it's a great place to start. So I encourage you, um, come back to it. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I know sometimes that Sunday morning you kind of leave church and you're like, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready to go to work tomorrow. I'm ready to, like, you know, be a good Christian. And then Monday comes, you're like, <laughs> is it Sunday yet? Right? So set, set yourself something. Give yourself a reminder. Put something in your bathroom. Open your Bible to Romans 12, chapter 9. Or, yeah. And, and, and just read it in the morning before you get a shower or right after or whatever. That way you'll be like, it'll be staring at you from your, you know, from your dresser. You're like, okay, I'll read it, you know. But set yourself a goal. Start trying to do these things. Make a checklist if it helps. These are very, very practical ways to go about doing this. Amen? Amen. Let's stand, guys. Father, we love you. Thank you for a, for a great morning, Lord. Thank you for a great word that Paul, as he wrote this um, 2,000 years ago, uh, it's still speaking to us today, and we're so grateful for that. But we just want to walk uh, faithful. We just want to walk um, in a way that is honoring. And, and, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand what it is to love our neighbors. And I, and I pray even more than that, Lord, that, that I know you're faithful to do that. You would give us opportunities to do that. And, Lord, it's a dangerous prayer to ask you to give us opportunities to stretch ourselves. But I know that you're faithful to sustain that your grace is sufficient in our weakness, and that where we fall short, you make up the difference. And Lord, I pray that you would help every person in here to be bold and be confident, to take even one thing from this list that Paul has given us, and that it would, it would open eyes to, to their own soul, but then those around them, Lord, they would begin to see what perfect love that casts out fear can do, what the love of God poured out into people can do and what a difference it can make when we love our neighbor as ourselves. God, you are wonderful. You're amazing. You give us the capacity, capacity to do this. It's only by your spirit inside us that we can that we can do this. And we thank you for it, Lord. We don't take it for granted. And, and, and I pray that you'd bless everyone here this morning. 
that you keep them safe as they go, uh, and that you'd be all over us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.